to? Check, check, check. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Sweet. Alright, he's good. Okay, cool. Check one two. Hey one two. Test test test. Check. Are you good? Okay, this one as well.
doing all right? Oh, yeah. 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 So, coming out. Hi. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for the last of what has been three budget meetings for the proposed 2023 DeKalb County budget. We had two prior meetings, one, the very first one on Wednesday, January 25th, and then the second meeting we had last Wednesday on February 8th, and this is the last. Commissioner Bradshaw uh, decided as the, uh, the appointed FAB committee chair that it was, would be important to come out to the community to share and engage constituents in the budget process. And TJ Sigler, who is here tonight, will be providing an overview of the budget. And if you haven't seen the link to access the budget, Robin has a, a QR code at the front desk, and I think we also have one on one of the slides. Uh, feel free to take your time and go through the full budget. TJ, what is it, 400, 500 pages? <laughs> yeah, some, something like that. So easy reading. Uh, tonight, for our viewers who are viewing via YouTube, please click on the title link for the meeting. That will allow you to have access to the chat room. And through the chat, we can take your questions and ask them at the end of this meeting. And I will now introduce to some and remind others, Commissioner Bradshaw, will you please join us up here? Thank you, sir. Yeah, you, you have to. <laughs> you didn't introduce yourself. Oh, I did not. I do that often. Good evening. I'm Alicia Brooks. I serve as Commissioner Bradshaw's Chief of Staff. 
All right, thanks, Alicia. Good evening, everybody. That was horrible. <laughs> Get them. Good evening, everybody. Better, better, better. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening. I, I know that everyone has busy lives, and there are plenty of other things that you could be doing on a Wednesday evening, but that you are here is a testament to your interest in our community, and I appreciate that. I'm Steve Bradshaw. I have the honor of representing District 4 on the DeKalb County Board of Commissioners, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Finance, Audit, and Budget Committee for this year. So the Organizational Act requires that the CEO submit a budget proposal to the Board of Commissioners by December the 15th of each year. And then we have until March 1st to either adopt it, reject it, or amend it. And normally we adopt the budget with amendments, and we are going through that exercise right now. Now regarding the budget, we have a regular public hearing process that is normally how we proceed and that's underway. But everyone doesn't have the opportunity to attend a regular Board of Commissioners business meeting on a Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. in downtown Decatur at the Maloof Building or a Finance, Audit, and Budget Committee meeting at 3.30 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon. Therefore, as chair of the Budget Committee uh, for this year, I thought it would be appropriate to bring this process to the people, so to speak, and hence we've scheduled a series of community information meetings for that purpose. This evening is the third in that series here at the Dunwoody Library, and our esteemed budget director, T.J. Siegler, will be leading us through the presentation, and I will be yielding the floor to him momentarily. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to thank our library director, Allison Weisinger, for affording us the opportunity to use our libraries for this series of meetings. And I want to st thank the staff here at the Dunwoody Library for hosting us this evening. I got to chat with them a little earlier, and they're doing an outstanding job. I'd also like to thank our IT director, John Matelski, and his team for ensuring that everything's in place for us to uh, do this meeting both in person and virtually. I always thank my, my buds at DCTV for always being available to support. I give those guys a hard time about their choice in professional football team allegiances, but uh, you know I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set that aside for the moment, uh, but they do an outstanding job. So at this point, I want to acknowledge uh, my BOC colleagues who are here this evening uh, and afford them the opportunity for any comments. I think my only colleague who's here at the moment is Commissioner Michelle Long Spears. So, Commissioner, if you have anything you want to share with the assemblage, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. And uh, I want to recognize the other elected officials who are here. Uh, the great mayor of Dunwoody just walked in, Lynn Deutsch. Jen, Lynn, is there anything? Mayor, I'm sorry. I don't want to be so informal. We're friends. Uh, Thank you for being here. Okay. All right. And then from the city council, Catherine Lautenbacher. Catherine, is there anything you'd like to share? No, thanks for coming on everyone. Happy to be here. Okay, if any more elected officials come in as we move forward, we will certainly give them the opportunity to address you. And, of course, I always thank uh, my, my staff for their support. I've said this multiple times. I'll say it again tonight. It would be impossible for me to discharge the duties of this office without their support. So Robin Fleeg, who's up front, Carrie Cordes, who's in the back, and our boss, uh, Alicia Brooks, who's the chief of staff. And, Keeps us, keeps us all straight. So before I yield to TJ, I'm going to make just a few general comments. Uh, the first thing I'll say is this. We as elected officials are charged with being responsible stewards of the taxpayer's money. It's not our money. It's the taxpayer's money. And uh, this is something that I take very, very seriously. Now, over the past several years, overall, I think DeKalb County's Finances have been managed in a highly competent and fiscally responsible manner. But being in public, public office for all these years, I've come to learn that no matter how much money a given governmental entity may have, the need always seems to be greater than the available resources. 
The need always seems to be avail greater than the available resources. Therefore, these jobs are about setting priorities and funding these priorities at the proper level. So I started my professional life as a United States Army officer, and my first company commander, Captain Elrin Hunley, used to say, Steve, if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. If everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. Now, what do you think he meant by that? Anybody want to take a stab at that? There needs to be a focused goal. Okay. All right. That's a good answer. Anybody else want to take a stab? If everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. Where do you you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Everything, because I've heard people say, everything's a priority. Well, no. You can't fund everything mm -hmm. to the extent that it needs to be funded. So how can everything be a priority? This is about making choices. And sometimes that means upsetting and disappointing people. Because my priorities may not exactly be your priorities. And that's why we come together to form a consensus over what our collective priorities are. That's called governing. So before I go any further, I saw our presiding officer come in. So uh, Commissioner Patrick, if you have anything you want to share with the assemblage before we proceed, I'll yield the floor to you. You're welcome. It's in every politician's DNA to speak when offered a microphone. So thank you very much, Commissioner Bradshaw. I, I do appreciate that. Um, I just want to say that, uh, again, thank you for um, going across the county, really, and, and showing everyone or giving everyone opportunity to see the 2023 budget for DeKalb County. I know we're in the city of Dunwoody, but this affects you guys, too. Uh, there are things that trickle down uh, that do make an impact on the services that are provided in, with Dunwoody. Uh, main things that I end up dealing with a lot with are obviously uh, sanitation, uh, yard clippings, yard waste, and household waste. My personal favorite, and I want to say thank you, dead deer collection. And when y'all come to me and say, hey, there's an issue out there, I want you to know that there's a gentleman here, Mr. Zach Williams, uh, who is the chief operating officer. He doesn't collect the dead deer, but, uh, but uh, Zach is my go-to guy. And so if there's ever anything that's on your mind, anything of concern from the county, uh, county services perspective, um, Zach is one of the people I talk with. Of course, obviously, Commissioner Bradshaw, Commissioner Spears as well, uh, our priority people that I talk with. Um, and so if he has anything you need, please let us know. I'm here to help, absolutely. So thank you, Steve. Appreciate you. Thanks, Commissioner Patrick. And uh, Zach, since you were put on the spot, you got the big job. Is there anything you want to say before we proceed? No, nothing, sir. All right. Well, Zach does an outstanding job as our chief operating officer. I know it's a big responsibility, and my interface with Zach has always been excellent. So uh, I'll move on, and then I'll move aside. So my first budget vote as a county commissioner was back in 2017, and I think that first budget set DeKalb County on a new course of fiscal responsibility. And I commend CEO Thurman for his stewardship of our money. Now, the CEO has stated on occasion in public settings that way back in 2017 on that budget vote, that my vote was the deciding vote on that budget. Now, I'd have to go back and look at the tape to make sure that's in fact true. But whether it's true or not, I was proud of that very first budget vote. Very proud of that vote. Now, in addition to passage and oversight of the overall county budget, each of us as commissioners has an office budget that we're required to manage. Now, I'll go back again to when I was a soldier and I overheard uh, Lance talking about this earlier, so he, will, he can attest to this. But we'd get to the end of the year, and if, if we hadn't spent all of our budget allocation, we'd get ordered to start spending you know, money, buying stuff, so our budget wasn't smaller next year. And I always found that to be a horrible practice. It, it's just, it's a bad practice. And since I've been in office as a commissioner, I've never done that. In fact, I have returned money to our general fund every single year that I've been in office. Now, during my private sector days, 
uh, in the corporate world, I learned that the numbers have to work, right? For any entity to have any kind of sustained success, the numbers have to work. And making the numbers work is a big job. And therefore, I commend TJ and all of the folks in our finance and budget departments for their diligence and their hard work in making the numbers work. At a fundamental level, depending on the size of an organization, budgets can be highly technical and complicated documents. DeKalb County's budget is a large budget. Lots of numbers. And even for me at times, so many numbers, my eyes start to glaze over looking at all the numbers. But hopefully TJ will help to demystify our budget at least to some extent this evening and help you all understand uh, at some level how this process works. Of course, at another level, a no more fundamental level, budgets are moral documents. In that, they are a statement about who we are and what we value. And hopefully this point will come through as well. So with that, uh, that's the end of my uh, planned remarks. And at this point, I'll yield the floor to the person you're really here to hear is our budget director, our steam budget director, T.J. Sigler. All right. Thank you, Commissioner, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. It's good to see you all. So again, my name is T.J. Sigler. I'm the director of the Office of Management and Budget for the county. And tonight we're going to go through a presentation that you know, starts out just talking about the budget process in general and how that works for the county. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail about the FY23 budget um, as proposed. So uh, the commissioner set this up well about what a budget really is. So, uh, you know, of course it is, you know, what we're spending our money on and, and how, but it is also a document that tells people what our priorities are. And it describes the, you know, our operations and is a communication tool for the public as well. And, you know, as has been said, you know, the, the process itself involves setting our priorities and then allocating the resources that we have available among those, those various priorities. Okay, a little bit about the Office of Management and Budget. So it was created in 2015. Uh, prior to that, the budget office was a division of the finance department. Um, so now, in, under the, the current uh, organization, OMB, or just the budget office uh, is what most people call it, um, reports directly to the COO. So Zach, right there, he's my boss. And then ultimately to the CEO. And um, our duties are really to help prepare the uh, executive budget recommendation that comes from the CEO and then is presented to the Board of Commissioners. Um, and then facilitating that process, you know, of getting the budget uh, reviewed, going through the committee process with the Board of Commissioners and having it adopted. Um, and then once the budget's adopted, our role kind of shifts to monitoring the budget, you know, tracking expenditures, doing projections of expenditures to try to spot any trouble areas before they come up. And, um, also, we, we work uh, a lot around the summertime with uh, setting our millage rates. And the millage rates, if you're not familiar with that term, is just a, a fancy way of saying the property tax rates. Um, so we, uh, I'll, I'll get into a bit more detail uh, on that later. But finally, you know, our, our role is to provide data and um, analysis to the elected officials. You know, we don't make the decisions. They are the decision makers. We are just here to help them make better decisions, hopefully. Okay, this is just a uh, little org chart. Um, so right there, the, the director, that's me. And then my whole office is a total of seven employees, including myself. So seven employees who uh, basically are responsible for managing a $1.7 billion annual budget. So pretty lean operation. Okay, and this is uh, the budget cycle in a uh, very simplified flow chart here. So we'll start at the top with the department submitting the budget request. So that typically occurs um, sometime during the fall. And uh, prior to that, you know, we go through some budget prep and we, you know, give the department's instructions and priorities for what uh, they should be doing for the budget this year. Um, but that's the first step in, in setting the budget. So once those requests come in, 
They come into our office. We do the initial review of that, you know, asking questions, working with the departments, making sure that we understand the request. And then we work with the, you know, the executive leadership to come up with the recommendation, which then goes to the board of commissioners. Whoops, sorry, skipped ahead. Here on December 15th of each year. And from that point, um, it goes through the, the board of commissioners review process. And one thing I'll mention here is our budget calendar is a little bit unusual for uh, most local governments that I'm aware of. Uh, so our fiscal year runs on a calendar year. Um, however, we typically don't adopt the budget until February of each year. And so for the first two months of the year, we operate under what we call a placeholder budget, which just basically allows us to continue operations at the same level that was authorized in the prior year. So that's kind of the, the phase that we're in right now until the, the proposed or the 2023 budget is adopted. So um, that's scheduled to, to happen on February 28th, um, which is really the last date that it can happen based on our organizational act, uh, which requires the budget to be adopted prior to March 1st. Okay, um, oops, keep hitting the wrong button. Here we go. So the next step, again, is when we get the... Um, the tax digest, and that uh, term, if you're not familiar, is uh, basically just the total value of all taxable property within the county. And so what that's you know, important for is we need that to be able to then say, okay, these are the millage rates that we need to set in order to cover the budget. Um, so we receive that in the spring, review it, and then come up with, a button with the millage rates and propose those to the Board of Commissioners. And there's a whole other process where there are hearings on the, the millage rate and advertisements and everything that needs to happen. And that's adopted during July, usually, usually the first meeting in July. Um, and at the same time, we usually also have a mid-year budget amendment, which is just an uh, opportunity for us to do some cleanup if there are any items that, um, in the original budget that we need to then you know, adjust at that point. And then the cycle starts all over again. Start working on next year. Can I ask you a question for you? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Commissioner Bradshaw talked about setting priorities. First question is, who sets priorities? The CEO, the commissioners, the COO, who sets those? And then the, the citizen input part. Mm -hmm. I mean, we go to these kind of meetings, but I guess is the citizen input at the commission meeting where we say, hey, we like this priority, we don't like that priority. And then our commissioners horse trade with the CEO, whoever sets the priority? Uh, I would say it's probably a little bit of all of the above. Um, you know, in our process, you know, since the CEO proposes the budget, okay. he has his priorities, which he sets, and that's basically what, you know, um, informs our decision of what the recommended budget is. Um, but, of course, you know, once it goes to the Board of Commissioners, they have the opportunity to amend the budget. So if they disagree with the priorities and they want to, um, you know, fund something else, they think this, this item is not as important as this one, they have the opportunity to do that. Um, I don't know that there's, uh, you know, there's not a formal process necessarily to say, okay, we're going to take this and this and this and come up with the priorities. It's more of an informal process that is, is informed, I think, through the public hearings that we do on the budget and just, you know, um, you know all of the, the policymakers working together to figure out, you know, what the priority is for the, for the county as a whole. All right, um, next thing, just talking a little bit about how the budget is built. So the basic building blocks are departments and funds. And so a department, um, you know, is something like the police department, the library system, but also in our, our budget speak, it can be something like our um, debt service payments. It could be something like our, um, I think of another good example. Uh, we have a department that we call non-departmental. So it's not necessarily something that's going to have operations in it, but it's uh, an accounting unit we use for budgeting purposes. And the reason is we set the budget, the, the legal level of control for the budget is the department level. So that way we're able to segregate certain um, dollar amounts for a certain purpose to go towards that rather than it being part of a department's budget. Um, and then each department is part of a fund. In a fund, you can think of it just basically of, um, it's a grouping of departments that either serve a similar um, 
tax base or a similar jurisdiction, or you know, the funding comes from a certain uh, source as well. And hopefully that'll make more sense once I go through a few more slides here. So there, there's a few nuances to that. So the CEO, um, all the administrator, all the executive branch departments report directly to the CEO, and he has control over, um, you know, managing their budget. So everything gets uh, basically processed through this this process. They make the request, but ultimately it's the CEO's decision of what to recommend in the budget. There are other County agencies, you know, if they're elected officials, um, you know, constitutional officers, where the CEO proposes a budget for them and then it's adopted by the, the Board of Commissioners, but they have more discretion on how they actually are able to spend that budget. We can't, you know, dictate, or the governing authority can't dictate to them, okay, this is how you need to spend every penny that's in your budget. Does that answer your question? All right, and then I guess you know one grouping above all this is what we call our fund class. So that's just a grouping of different types of funds based on their function or, or you know, how they're um, financed. And the example here is our enterprise funds. So enterprise funds are any of our funds that um, you know, operate more like a business in the sense that you pay for a service and then that's how they, they pay to provide the service. So a good example of that is our watershed management department. You get a water bill for the amount of water you use, and that's what is then used to run the department. Okay? Um, a lot of what people think of when they think of the county budget, though, is what we call our tax funds. And so they're called that because they get the majority of their revenue through taxes, specifically property taxes as well as sales tax. And there's... Um, Seven total tax funds, uh, six of them that are active, and I think only five of them have millage rates associated with them. So I'll try to briefly explain each of those. Um, the largest one is our general fund. And the way to think about that is that's countywide operations as well as any of the administrative functions of the county. So the uh, good examples are the court system, the sheriff, the district attorney, or you can think about the CEO or the board of commissioners since they are responsible for duties you know, that cover the entire county, they are part of the general fund. In the general fund, there is a millage rate associated with that. So if you get, when you get your property tax bill, if you live in DeKalb, there will be a line that says county operations, and that is for the general fund. And everyone in the county, whether you live in a city or unincorporated, pays the same millage rate for the general fund, since it's for countywide services. Police services, I think, is, should be fairly uh, self-explanatory. But um, unlike the general fund, it's not a county-wide uh, tax fund. Because if you live in a city and you provide your own police services, then there's no millage rate that applies to the, any of the properties in that city from the county. The cities would have their own millage rate, um, I think, in pretty much all cases. At least if they provide police services, they do throughout the county. Then uh, fire is most of the county, with the exception of Decatur and City of Atlanta, who have their own fire department. So, um, but the rest of the county is all part of what we call our fire district. So we provide the, the fire service, we being the county, and then they, everyone in those areas would pay the, the millage rate associated with fire. Then the designated services fund is probably the one that's least obvious uh, by its name. But that's to cover our roads and, and drainage, transportation, and parks and recreation departments. And that's similar to the police fund, where uh, not everyone in the county would pay that millage rate. It's up to the cities whether or not they want to participate in that, um, in those services. So if they opt out of those services, that means the county doesn't provide those services there. And, you know, there's no millage rate for the county to provide those services in those areas. Right, so and that's a good example because actually until this year, we provided the roads and transportation services to Tucker. We still provide the police services to Tucker. So if you live in the city of Tucker, instead of you paying a millage rate to Tucker for police, you pay the county's millage rate for police. Um, but yeah, and 
this year, well, actually, back in uh, November, they passed a referendum to take over the um, roads and drainage and transportation part of it as well. And then the last one here is our unincorporated fund. And this one's a little bit different from the others because there is no millage rate associated with it. So all the uh, revenues that are generated for the unincorporated fund come from sources that are only collected within the unincorporated areas or are based on some formula that's, you know, uh, uses the unincorporated population. So that would be things like our franchise fees, business licenses, um, and we also get an insurance premium tax from the state. And so that's an example of one of the ones that's based on the unincorporated population. We get a, a distribution from the state. So do the fees collected in the district unincorporated, are they spent on just the unincorporated? For the most part. So uh, I'll try not to get too far in the weeds here. But So the unincorporated fund generates more revenue than what it, it spends because there are certain services that are strictly for unincorporated residents. But then there are other services that, like the designated services fund, which are mostly for unincorporated residents. So whatever the excess revenue we generate in the unincorporated fund goes to pay for those services that mostly benefit the, um, the unincorporated areas of the county. All right, uh, three other tax funds here. Um, one is the hospital fund, so that's another countywide millage rate, and that goes to support uh, Grady Healthcare System. Uh, countywide bonds, this one is inactive at this point. Um, it was to pay the debt on some uh, general obligation bonds that were approved uh, through referendum, but uh, I think two years ago we retired that debt, so there's no longer a, a millage rate that's being levied for that. And then the unincorporated bonds are similar to the countywide bonds. It's just that it was a smaller geographic area that voted to, um, to issue those, those geo, geo bonds. And calling it the unincorporated bonds is a bit of a misnomer because it really is everything that was unincorporated at the time the bonds were issued. So, for instance, we're in the city of Dunwoody, which was not a city at the time. So they would, if you live in the city of Dunwoody, you would also pay the millage rate for the unincorporated bonds. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner. You know, I'm a new commissioner, so right. I'm still learning about our county budget. And I know that we are in conversations right now about the Grady contract extension, or actually a new contract. It's already been extended. Does 100% of the funds from the hospital cover that Grady contract, or do they have to pull from, like, the general fund to supplement? No, 100% of what we contribute to Grady comes from the hospital fund. Okay. I think the only exception I can think to that is what um, I think we appropriated some of the American Rescue Plan funds to Grady. But out of our operating budget, uh, it all comes from the hospital fund. Okay, thank you. And I guess, you know, to that point, what comes out of the uh, hospital fund is, you know, what we agreed to in that contract. But there is, on occasions, too, additional funds that we agree to you know, provide to Grady. For instance, we had some capital funding in the last two years for the, um, the Pont Center. So um, one thing, you, if you're looking at the budget this year, you're going to see that the hospital fund went down by $3.2 million. But that's because it was to fund that project, and we've fully funded it now. So SPLOS funds are not part of the $1.7 billion operating budget, not part of the annual budget, because um, it's capital funding. And so capital funding, rather than it being appropriated annually, it is um, a project-length budget. And that's actually... Um, it never expires. <laughs> well, right. If you go to a SPLOS account, like an escrow account, they never come in. So, and, and this is Chris. He's our, our SPLOS guy, so he's probably the best best prepared to answer that question, but um, and, and that's also our capital and our grants functions are managed by, still managed by the Department of Finance rather than my office, so it's, it's a slightly different pot of money. Well, it is a different pot of money and it's administered differently than the uh, operating budget is. Okay, um, I already touched on the Enterprise Fund, so besides water and sewer, we also have the stormwater fund and our sanitation fund and the airport. So again, those are all operations that support themselves through user fees or charges. 
Uh, next class of, uh, next fund class is what we call our internal service funds. And so there's uh, four of those. There's risk management, which includes our employee benefits and insurance, uh, workers' compensation, uh, vehicle replacement, and fleet management. And so these internal service funds, the way that we fund those is each of the, the user departments throughout the county pays fees or charges to these funds to cover the cost of these operations. So, um, you know, every department that has employees in it pay a certain charge to the risk management fund to cover insurance for the employees. Or if you have vehicles in your department, then you pay a charge to the vehicle uh, replacement fund to be able to replace those when they're at the end of their useful life. Or you pay the fleet management for fuel and all the costs associated with actually running the fleet. Well, no, I would say no. Um, I, I think in maybe some some jurisdictions, they they are able to generate some additional revenue that then they can use for other purposes. But we basically run it like it's a self-contained. You know, it, it you know everything that's generated in revenue stays within that fund. We don't use it to supplement the uh, general fund or any other county operations. All right, uh, next group is our special revenue funds. And you can see there's a long list of them here. Uh, best way to describe that is any fund where there's a dedicated revenue source for a certain purpose. Um, so the two big ones here are our 911 fund and our development fund. So 911, of course, is providing the, the services. You know, when you call 911, that's the operators that pick up and dispatch someone to your location. And that's funded mostly through a um, charge that you see on your, your telephone bill. You'll see E911 service charge or something to that effect. And those funds go to the state, and then they distribute that to the county. Um, then the development fund, that's, responsible, that's the fund that's responsible for doing uh, building inspections and issuing permits and all that. And all the fees that are, are generated from that then go back into that development fund to run the operations. Um, some of the other ones, though, are a little bit different, um, and maybe the best example is the hotel motel tax. So, and, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about departments, where we have a department, but it's not exactly what you would traditionally think of as a department. So, hotel motel tax, that's a tax that um, anyone who stays in a hotel in unincorporated cab, they pay a tax, and then the county receives that, that fund, you know, those, the proceeds from that tax. But there are specific purposes that that tax can be used for. You know, part of it has to go towards tourism, um, you know, promoting tourism. Part of it goes to developing tourism products. And then there is a portion that is able to go back into county operations. What is that percentage on the hotel motel? Because I think some places you get a $7 charge and, or is it 1% or 2% of the actual bill? You're putting me on the spot. I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I, I think it's... Don't, don't hold me to this, but I think it's 8% here. I have a question. Hmm? Um, so when people are thinking about different sources of funding a new project or a new initiative, I've often heard, well, get a chance on hotel. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Is that because you can increase that percentage easily? Or no, not necessarily. Like? So I, I, I think maybe, um, you know, like I said, there, there's a portion of it that's set aside for the uh, tourism product development is what they call it in the law. And that, you know, has a fairly broad definition. So if it's anything like a park space or anything that's going to, you know, potentially allow, you know, attract tourists to visit the county, then it's a, an allowable use. And for, I think, many years, that money was just kind of accumulating and we weren't really, you know, budgeting it or spending it on anything. But there has been, you know, over the last few years, more of a push to, to find uses for that. So... And that might be why you hear about it is because, like I said, there was sort of an accumulation of funding there. But it's not, you know, just a pot of money that you can dip into for whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next group is our revenue bond funds. So these are um, also to pay the, the debt service for bonds. But unlike the general obligation bonds, these bonds are backed up by revenues from the other funds. So... Um, the building authority fund, for example, 
those bonds were issued to build the juvenile court building. So juvenile court is a countywide operation, so the general fund actually pays the debt for the building authority uh, bonds. All right, so shifting now into the 2023 budget recommendations. Uh, these are CEO Thurman's uh, budget priorities that he set for this year. And, um, you know, so the, the instructions that were sent out to departments listed these out and said that, you know, these are the priorities and this is what, you know, you should be looking to do uh, within your, your 2023 budget requests. In the next few slides, we'll go through these kind of one by one and talk about what's highlight some of the things that are in the proposed budget for 2023. Okay, the first one here is public safety. Um, I won't read that all the text at the top there. That's just kind of the blurb that was included with the instructions. So uh, we do have this presentation online. So if you are interested, you can go and, and check that out and read that for yourself. Um, but some of the big initiatives with um, public safety are dealing with uh, staffing. So um, police, there's $9.7 million to fund 20, 222 positions, some of those vacant, some of those new positions. Uh, fire rescue also has about $9.2 million for 158 positions. I, I believe all those are vacant, so they're not necessarily new, but we're, we're trying to get them um, filled. Uh, sheriff has $5.4 million to fund 123 positions. Um, and then some of the other ones down here are, are more, um, you know, maybe out of the box for what you think of as public safety, but uh, $600,000 is budgeted for, proposed for the Superior Court to fund some of their violence prevention programs. Um, and then co-compliance, uh, they have a little over 500, I mean, a little over half a million dollars um, to hire and equip six new code officers. And really the purpose of uh, those new officers is to help um, implement and uh, enforce our, we have a, a video camera surveillance ordinance that um, requires video surveillance at convenience stores. And that uh, was passed last year and we're still kind of ramping that up. Does that also fit in with uh, these uh, compliances for homes that have <coughs> roofs and stuff like that? Because I see the Cass County going through uh, neighborhoods and then I see these notices that they place on homes and Well, that is part of that. Uh, that's definitely what co-compliance does. Is their their role is to, uh, you know, cite any of those code violations and then to um, process that. But the these six officers specifically, though, were you know intended as part of the implementation of that uh, video surveillance ordinance for convenience stores. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner. Um, so I read that the way I read this and interpret it is that the police are hoping to hire. And or fill 222 vacant or new positions this year. How many did they hire or fill last year as a comparison? I don't have that number off the top of my head. But, um, you know, I, I, I can say, though, that, you know, just like many governments and, you know, even private employers, you know, the, the labor market is very tight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've, we've had an issue, you know, even before this, you know, where, um, you know, it's hard to find police officers. It's hard to fill those positions. So um, I let Zach chime in here. Right. So, Commissioner, and I think probably in 2022 would be a net loss. Right. I mean, that's, that's been kind of the history. But what we had, thanks to the governing authority back in early summer, early to mid-summer, um, additional initiatives that allowed for increasing um, the pay for police officers increased, uh, we hire laterals, uh, which is quite desirable, quite frankly, because then you don't have to pay for the extensive uh, academy training. Um, and so I believe um, we were offering uh, $5,000 for uh, persons to come in with a uh, law enforcement uh, certification. Um, additionally, we have hired a, an executive or a recruiting firm uh, who is going to literally assist us by looking nationally. We have determined that as we compete with Atlanta, Cobb, Gwinnett, the various <coughs> municipalities, we're all fishing in the same pond. So what we are looking to do is to expand where we're looking. So uh, we have hired a firm and they've been putting together a recruitment strategy uh, that is 
going to take us throughout the nation. Is I'm sorry, just this one. I'm sorry. Our viewers cannot hear your questions or the responses because you don't have a mic. And this has been really good, the questions and the answers. But if we can just hold until the end so that they can hear the questions and responses. Sorry about that. Thank you. All right. So um, moving on. Uh, the next uh, priority was retention, hiring, and training. And you, you'll see that a lot of these, there's overlap between them because we were just talking about public safety and, you know, one of the big challenges there is staffing. And so um, and COO had pointed out several of the things. And a lot of that was, uh, were actually things that we did in 2022. But they, those do carry over to this year. So they're part of what we call it, you know, the base budget for this year. So it might not show up as new spending, but it's a continuation of, of some of those initiatives we had last year. Um, one thing we are proposing new for this year is a 4% uh, COLA um, across all departments. That's a $8.4 million cost uh, prorated for the, the effective date of that adjustment. Um, there's about $170,000 for training professional development and dues. And then uh, this last one, there's no number attached to it. And it really goes back to what I was saying is that um, there were a lot of initiatives uh, that were introduced in the 2022 budget. Um, there were pay adjustments for uh, critical you know, positions, you know, any of the departments that were having trouble keeping people, um, you know, especially police and fire. You know, we, we made a uh, conscious choice to increase their compensation to uh, be more competitive. Um, so all that, though, adds cost to the 2022 or 2023 budget um, because when we do something in one year, you know, typically it's for a partial year, and then the next year we got to pay for it for the full year. Okay, community health and well-being. Uh, some of the highlights there is $800,000 in fire rescue for uh, five vehicles as part of their mobile integrated health um, paramedicine program. Uh, we have $1.5 million for human services to provide meals at senior centers and uh, fund some new positions for them. Uh, I think they have a new senior center or two coming online or just came online. And uh, parks, there's about $1.9 million for various therapeutic programming and other operating expenses that's being added in the 23 budget. All right, beautification and placemaking. Uh, this one, uh, we have about a million dollars for beautification, which is uh, the unit that... Um, you know, helps to go out and pick up, you know, litter, you know, clean off the, the do what they call curb bumping. Um, so that, via, you know, the equipment's going to be a, a real asset to them to be able to, to do that more frequently and do a better job of it. Um, planning, there's uh, about 650000 there for some uh, small area studies and other um, matching funds for grants to... Um, help with uh, some of the planning and development. Uh, economic development, there's an additional 500000 proposed for uh, Decide to Cab, which is our development authority. Uh, we have a contract with them where they provide the economic development services for the county. And then there's $100,000 proposed for the uh, Small Business Recovery Program, which is a program that's uh, offered by the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And finally, sanitation, there's $6.6 .6 million for vehicles and equipment, as well as funding for uh, positions. And so sanitation was another one of those departments where, you know, we've had, we've been hard hit by staffing shortages. And, um, you know, it's also just been um, a challenge, you know, funding some of their, their needs in recent years. So, all right. And I think that's the last of the priorities. So sustain and improve county-owned assets. This has been a big focus recently. Um, you know, for many years, there wasn't much money that was available to go towards capital improvement or even, you know, ongoing maintenance for a lot of our, our capital assets. So um, that's really picked up, I'd say, in the last five years. And this year might be the biggest one as far as what 
being contributed from the operating budget. So total, we have about $51 million set aside for uh, various capital projects, and those would include things like uh, work at the county courthouse, uh, projects at the jail, um, and various other projects. You know, some, a lot of it, too, is for um, technology needs. You know, we've seen a lot of increase in uh, what IT needs, especially with the pandemic, and you know, um, even though we're not working remotely as much as we were, that's still you know, been a, a, a big demand on the budget for the last few years. So that's um, even outside of the capital projects for technology, there's about $3 million across multiple departments to just upgrade their computers or replace them and do other technology upgrades. And then uh, vehicle additions, uh, about half a million dollars across all the funds and departments for new vehicles as well. All right, this is uh, the timeline. We kind of hit on this earlier. So um, those priorities and instructions were sent to departments on December 2nd, which is uh, later than typical. Um, and then they had basically one week to turn those around to us. So December 9th is when we got the request from the departments. And then December 15th is when we submitted the budget to the Board of Commissioners. Um, that brings us to where we are now with the community budget information meetings. Uh, this is the third of three. And then um, tomorrow is actually the first official public hearing on the budget. So um, at 10 o'clock during the Board of Commissioners meeting tomorrow, there will be a public hearing on the budget, and that's kind of the first hearing, you know, uh, official action on the budget. Um, and then the final second hearing and the adoption of the budget is scheduled for February 28th. And so in between those times, there will also be committee meetings where they will uh, discuss different departments' budgets based on you know, whatever committee of jurisdiction it is. Okay, um, this is just a, a pie chart to show um, how the budget is split up among the different types of funds we talked about. So uh, the biggest uh, slice there in blue is our um, general fund. It's just over 51%. Uh, and followed by our enterprise funds at 30%. Then the internal service funds are 17%, and then you can see the revenue bond and special revenue funds are um, together maybe not even 3% of the total annual budget. All right, and this is just showing the tax fund revenue by the different funds. Uh, the biggest piece there is our general fund at 58%, then police at 17 and fire fund at 12 And this is where the, the revenue for the tax funds comes from. So the, the red, what you see there is our property taxes, which is uh, about 54% of the revenue that we use for the tax funds. And then the blue up there is what is called e-host here. And e-host uh, stands for the Equalized Homestead Option Sales Tax. So it's a one penny sales tax, and the proceeds of that are used to then provide tax relief to homeowners in DeKalb County. So if you... Uh, own your home here and you, you occupy it, you have a homestead exemption, the proceeds of that then are used to give you a credit on your property tax bill. And that applies to the countywide millage rate, so for the general fund and the hospital fund. And in the last two years, we've been able to provide 100% credit for those millage rates for, um, for homeowners. So a way to think about that is if not for the e-host, that other 20% of revenue would have, to be, would have to come from property taxes. So it's a big benefit to um, you know, our homeowners here in DeKalb. All right, um, this is probably kind of small for you all to see, but uh, this is just showing our, our proposed budget broken up from the tax funds. And we broke it into two different groups here, what we call our operating tax funds and then our um, non-operating, which are the hotel, or excuse me, the hospital and the bond funds. Um, they're broken up just that way because um, hospital and the bond funds don't actually fund operations. It's more for debt service or for providing subsidies to, to um, Grady. Um, but one thing I'll, I'll highlight here is uh, the CEO has made it his goal to have uh, two months of reserves for the tax funds. So if you look here in this uh, total reserves column, you can see it by fund. 
and then you know the totals at the bottom and then the overall total down here. And so officially the county policy is to have one month of fund balance or one month of reserves. Um, so we're doing you know, a lot better than the one month. We're doing twice, twice as good, I guess you would say. Um, and the other thing is um, we're, we're also at the point where all of these funds, the, the operating tax funds, are also at two months uh, themselves. You know, prior to this year, we were at two months overall, but some of them were below two months and some of them were above two months. And so now we're kind of getting to the point where they're stable at that two-month level. All right, and then this uh, table just shows, um, you know, the, the budget broken up a different way, showing it by the different fund classes. And here's the total for the uh, proposed budget. It's $1.7 billion. So that's a 9.3% increase over um, last year's budget. And like I said, a lot of that is, is really just continuation of, of things that were done in the 2022 budget rather than necessarily new programming. All right, this um, shows uh, the tax digest. And so to, to remind you, that's the value of all taxable pro property in the county. And uh, the blue bars are the gross tax digest. So that would be the value of all taxable property at the 40% assessment rate. So when your property is appraised, they take the fair market value and then they assess it at 40%. And then the green is our net tax, tax digest. So that's the gross minus any of the exemptions, um, homestead exemptions, there's senior exemptions. Uh, really the biggest exemption for the county is our um, property assessment freeze exemption. And one thing I'll point out here is if you look at the trend, you can see that the gap between the blue and the green is growing. And that's largely due to that assessment freeze exemption. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that, basically if you have a homestead exemption, um, can't remember the, the year that it went into effect. There we go. Um, actually, we might, it might have been before that, I think. There you go. That sounds right. Um, but uh, the way that would work is if you have that freeze as part of your homestead exemption, the year that you purchased your house is set as the base year, the base year value. And so then if your assessment goes up, you receive an exemption uh, basically equal to the amount of that appreciation between your base year and whatever the current year's assessment is. So as property values increase, uh, we don't necessarily see an increase in the uh, tax digest of what we can actually, you know, use to, to generate revenue due to that freeze. There is growth from other areas, but um, that is something that, you know, has led to that larger gap there. Okay, this is showing the annual change in the tax digest um, over the past, uh, I guess that's six years there, seven years. Um, and you'll see those dotted lines, the 8.6%, that's been the average over that time. And then the uh, lower one, the 7.4, well, the 8.6 is, is the average of the gross tax digest. And the 7.4 is the average for the net tax digest. Um, 2022 was a very good year in terms of the tax digest. Uh, the gross it grew by almost 15%, and then the net was about 8.4%. Um, we're projecting, we're being a lot more conservative in our projections this year, though, about 5.5% growth in the gross digest, and then 3.5% in the net. And that's just based on a lot of national indicators that show that the, the real estate market is cooling down. It's not... It's not falling like it did during the Great Recession, but we just don't expect it to grow as quickly as it has recently. All right, and this is the last slide. We always try to close out here um, just because it's, it's a point of pride for us. Um, this is our ending fund balance. And so the ending fund balance is just, you know, how much money is left in the bank at the end of the year is maybe the simplest way to explain it. And if you look at the start here, 2010, we ended the year with a negative $4 million for the tax funds. So we were in the hole. And that was, you know, again, during the Great Recession when the bottom fell out of the economy, especially in the real estate market. And, you know, that was the, the low point there. 
And then for the next several years, you know, we bounced around a little bit. You know, we recovered but weren't really where we wanted to be. And then you'll see, you know, starting really in 2017 is where we've made some sustained progress into in growing our fund balance. Um, the only dip here is in 2020, and that was COVID-related, where we uh, had some revenue declines that, um, you know, obviously weren't anticipated uh, before the pandemic. But for 2022, and I'll stress that this is a projection still because we haven't closed the books on 2022, but the projection when we were working on the budget was about $201 million in fund balance to the end uh, 2022. So to come from negative four to over 200 million, you know, is something we're proud of. All right, and finally, this is just the link to the uh, website where you can find the budget, the proposed budget, and uh, as well as a lot of other information. Um, this presentation is up there. Um, we actually, um, I uploaded a, a new version of the budget that had a lot more detail this afternoon before I left the office. I checked just before I, I started to speak, and I don't think IT has pushed it out there yet, but it should be up there momentarily. So, um, and I, I checked the, the page count on that. It's 278 pages, so you can knock yourself out with that. So, uh, but that's the end of my presentation, so I guess I'll turn it over to Alicia. Thank you. Is it on? Thank you. Thank you, TJ. All right, we're going to get into the Q&A. There were a lot of great questions. Uh, throughout the uh, presentation, so we'll start. Does anybody have a question? Mayor, coming to you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? First, Commissioner Bradshaw, thank you very much for bringing this to Dunwoody and taking it on the road. Um, most people know probably because you heard I'm the mayor of Dunwoody, and so I don't love it when other people meddle in my budget, and so I do this reluctantly. I was pleased to see that public safety is the very first priority, but you left off a really important factor of public safety, which is EMS. What we are doing in DeKalb is not working. In 2018, it was not working mostly in Dunwoody. In 2023, from what I hear from my peer mayors, it's not working very well anywhere. And so I have to imagine that for the commissioners and your unincorporated areas, it's likely not working very well there either. We pay nothing as a county for EMS services. As I understand it, we don't have a supplement for AMR. We don't have, a, Chief Fulham does the best he can in a tight labor market. But he, and he purchased some rescue vehicles that he cannot staff as I understand it. So let me tell you about the last 10 days, just what I know of what's happened in Dunwoody. We had a woman who was in significant pain and had no one to take her to the hospital. The fire department showed up. They were very nice and very professional. Eventually, they told her no one was coming, and she called a friend. And in this case, potentially a mobile nurse vehicle could have been part of the solution, except that if that vehicle cannot transport you to the emergency room or even to an urgent care in a county that's only getting older and has lots of high-risk um, residents who live in poverty and don't necessarily have the resources to get themselves, that's only going to help a little bit and that's something to think about with those vehicles and what purpose they're going to serve. The second one was a car motorcycle accident, a high school senior not wearing a helmet, driving a motorcycle way too fast, the accident was his fault. It took 55 minutes for an EMS vehicle to to arrive to transport him. And that vehicle came from Sandy Springs because my police officers on site had to pick up the phone and manually call. There was a child that had a seizure at Perimeter Mall and EMS never came. And those are just the three I know about. And we, so we get the data. So this year in Dunwoody, and some of you are Dunwoody residents and you may be aware of this, I raised property taxes because we couldn't afford ambulance and we couldn't afford what we needed to pay to compensate our police officers. And I made a really hard decision, but it looks to me like in this budget, there is potentially some room for choices. Uh, there are best practices with EMS. Um, some counties have a provider and a backup provider. 
Some counties run it. Gwinnett is still doing it in-house, and then they have a backup provider. And to be clear, nowhere in the country is having great EMS services anymore. But, but what, what's happening to us in DeKalb, and I'm sorry I'm lecturing, but, and there should have been two other county commissioners. What's happening to us in Gwinnett and DeKalb is that we can't control what AMR is paying. And just like we're doing with fire and just like what we're doing with police, and I was shocked to learn how little uh, EMS uh, drivers, they make very little. And so if we're gonna fix this for the county, and I think we should, we have to look at how that contract is laid out and what that means. Because if we have, what was the f fire number, 100 and something fire short-ish, our, what we're told consistently in Dunwoody when we raise these issues is, is that it doesn't matter how long it takes for the ambulance to get there because fire is first on scene, but we're seeing those, and on every fire truck there's an EMT and a paramedic. And all I want, you know, I'm here to support the county, but this service is crit a critical part of public safety. Think about it, you're short on firemen, you're short on police officers, who has to sit there and wait for the ambulance to come? I mean, this is a, like a domino effect. If you don't have enough firemen and they're stuck at a woman with a, probably a severe stomach virus as house because EMS isn't coming, you just unnecessarily tied up your first responders. So please consider that, thank you. Questions? Yes. Got a couple of questions in the presentation. You talked about uh, the the reserve. How is the the reserve used? I know it's kind of a is it's kind of a, an emergency fund. If something happens out of the ordinary, you have to go there. And if you don't use it in a particular year, does it roll over and grow? And then the other question was when you had the the slide with the uh, police fire and and uh, the department where you're trying to get more staff. Do those departments have flexibility to use that money? Say, if you, I'm trying to get a policeman, I want to give him a a, a new homeowner, you know, help him with a down payment to move to the cab. Do those agencies have flexibility to be creative with those incentives and dollars to get those people in place? All right. I, I think I forgot your first question now. Just. Uh, the reserves. reserves. Yes. So, uh, the reserves. I, I want to make a distinction between the reserves and our fund balance. So, the reserves are a budgeted amount where we say when we're setting the budget, this amount of revenue or this amount of funding we're holding in reserve, and then we can't spend it unless we, you know, amend the budget to, to then appropriate for something. And then fund balance, though, is what we end the year with. And so if something is reserved, it will roll over in the fund balance. But the fund balance would also include anything that was uh, budgeted in, in department's budgets that wasn't spent. So that's why you'll see the reserves are $140 million and the fund balance was $200 million, just basically because there were um, $60 million that wasn't spent last year. Um, to your second question about the flexibility to use funding, there is flexibility, but it's not solely at the department's discretion. So a good example of that is last year, um, like we mentioned when we uh, you know, enhanced the compensation for police officers and fire uh, fighters, um, we were able to do that without amending the budget. And really it was because we had funded positions that they weren't able to fill. We decided, you know, rather than just having you know, funded positions sitting on the book and you know, not spending that money, it makes more sense to offer incentives to get people to come here and then to provide better compensation to our existing employees to keep them here. So there is that, that flexibility, but it's, it's not, like I said, solely at the discretion of the department head. You know, that's a decision that you know, goes through the, the CEO, at least uh, for all departments that um, report to the CEO. Do have a Thank you so much for having uh, this uh, for for the county. Um, I did want to say, as the the number one priority was safety, um, and there was a you know lack of t 222 police officers, but there's a violence prevention um, program that you guys are looking to, and that's about six hundred thousand um, dollars. 
um, and the budget for the police officers was about, uh, I think about $9 million. Mm -hmm. So in regards to uh, the statement that was made above that report, they said that there's a spike in crime in DeKalb County. So the violence prevent, I would, I have two questions, but the first one is, um, I wanted to ask why is, if safety is the priority and we have that type of dynamic right now in DeKalb County, why is the violence prevention programs like one of the least fun funded? Well, let me uh, clarify that. What's on in this presentation are just highlights. It's not the whole full budget. And um, also talking about, you know, this is the annual budget. We also have grant funds and other funds that aren't reflected in here. And so um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the American Rescue Plan Act, but it was part of the COVID uh, relief funds that were, um, I guess it was initially passed in 2021. And so the county received a total of 100 and close to $150 million. I think it was 147. Um, and a large portion of the first tranche that we received of that in 2021 went towards violence prevention programs like that. And so actually that 600,000 that were, was highlighted here was initially funded through um, ARP or ARPA funds. And this though, since that money has been, you know, been used at this point, this is then absorbing that cost within the annual operating budget. So, you know, it's, it's really, a, again, an all of the above approach. You know, it's not that we're prioritizing police over these other, you know, programs that would help to address the issue. Um, it's, it's a mix, and, but yeah, police is you know, a very large budget for us, and you know, the, the personnel itself is very expensive, so that's why the, the number is so big. I don't know that it's necessarily a reflection of, you know, oh, we value you know, police over other programs to address it, and I don't know, I'll let Zach also. Excellent question. Yes. Um, Sorry. Whatever and I take it kind of to twofold, and, and I'm Zach Williams, the, the COO. When you talk about you have violence pre prevention, crime prevention, right, all, all of the above, really, something that we've recognized for years is we're not going to arrest our way to a safe community, right? right? So what you're going to see in this budget and the budget for the past several years is much more of a holistic approach to public safety. So you, what you were just talking about are some uh, diversion programs or uh, violence prevention programs in the courts. So the mere fact that we're funding things in the courts um, is, is kind of non-traditional, not just looking at police. But when you look at our beautification investment, and people don't typically think of it, but if you think in terms of kind of our code enforcement, kind of the whole broken window theory, right? So if you let communities kind of decay or look dilapidated, and then they become breeding grounds for crime you know, drug sales, and then which leads to what have you. And so our continued investment in beautification is also about crime. When you look at our investments in parks and recreation, something that we think of is when we're investing in parks, it's not simply giving the children an op opportunity to recreate. We see that we are competing um, for the time and minds and, and energy of our young people against the gangs, against the drug dealers, and so forth. So we're ensuring that we're investing in parks programming um, for that reason, too. So when you look throughout our budget, take the, and, and TJ mentioned earlier, the, um, the code enforcement officers. Their uh, sole responsibility will be um, working with these um, convenience stores because quite, and, and the video surveillance program, quite often if you look at crime, um, whether it's in DeKalb, Atlanta, Seattle, Dallas, where have you, there's some common um, um, places. Extended stay hotels, convenience stores, right? And so what uh, the governing with, with Commissioner Bradshaw and his colleagues have done is implemented an ordinance that requires convenience stores and gas stations and such to have video surveillance. And what we will be doing is creating an environment that is less hospitable to drug dealing and all that type of activity that leads to, well, it's criminal to begin with and it leads to uh, violence and so forth. So the investment is actually throughout the budget. And if I might, I wanna plug some, uh, t at least two programs that the county currently um, facilitates through youth services. 
One is a rise, called the Rise Up Program that Commissioner Bradshaw has allocated funding to for the last three years. And this program targets middle school young boys of color, and last year we went to high school boys. And to CEO Williams' point, we, this is an all and everything that we can do to capture the attention of our, of our, of our young children. Uh, I welcome you to visit our website as well as youth services and you can see all that the county is pouring in to our communities for our youth. And then an, a new initiative that Commissioner Bradshaw has partnered with Big Brothers Big Sisters uh, of Metro Atlanta that I'm extremely pleased about this partnership. And this program that we're doing, what we're, in, it, what, we're initiating is to recruit men to mentor young boys in DeKalb County. And right now there are about 150 young children on the wait list for mentors in DeKalb County. And it's our intention to get those children matched with mentors. They call them bigs. If anybody's familiar with Big Brothers Big Sister, they call them bigs. So we're very excited about this, this initiative, this campaign. It was launched last month and we're smack dab in the middle of it. And if you know anybody, any men, women who are interested and think they might want to do it, please reach out to our office and we'll connect you to Big Brothers Big Sisters. But you had a second question. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. I also noticed that there was a 1.9 million in parks. Um, so I see the general like focus of doing you know, for the youth and for the community. Um, the other question is how, and it's so good that you kind of answered the question that I had afterwards, is how do you find the programs that, you know, geared towards the violence prevention, mm -hmm. which is really good that the commissioner is focused on that because that's generally what we're trying to take care of. Um, how is How are the programs introduced? And then I had a follow-up question because uh, you mentioned how, um, the uh, the program the violence prevention programs are within the the court systems. Is is this one like a separate entity, or are they like in the same um, same loop of the programs that you mentioned, and then the program that you also mentioned? Right. So, what I was there's a multitude of programs. Okay. So throughout the courts, whether it's juvenile court, okay. superior court, state court, um, there's a number of various programs uh, throughout the court systems, and some of the you know, if you look at the drug court, which is an excellent, uh, I'm going to miss many of them, so I'm not going to call them, but yeah. The veteran, the veteran court, treatment, court. right. Right, and so each of those are designed to do the same thing, which is to take people, um, really give them a second chance, give them an opportunity to get on their feet and not to either be a victim or a victimizer. So, um, so the court system has programs, police, police athletic league, um, the programs that they just mentioned, uh, the commissioner Bradshaw has, um, there's just a myriad throughout our organization. And how do you learn about how to you access this information? If you are not receiving commissioner Bradshaw's communications, please sign up with Robin and you'll get more information than you ever want, but it's all good information, right? We, we send it out. Any other questions? Mine really isn't a question. It's more of a thank you so much, TJ, because there was a lot that you shared here that I was unaware, although I was aware of a lot of it. But, I mean, you opened my eyes to a lot of this. And then Commissioner Bradshaw, just your opening to introduce him, I thought that was very, very, you know, nice. It was very professional, and it kind of gave him a leeway right into it. And then, man, I tell you, I loved what you talk about in terms of the violence programs and stuff. I know that we have HWPL who are a, um, I'm going to just say a peace education group, and that's one of the things that they're championing. And so I'm sure that probably sometime tomorrow they'll be on the website looking, trying to get more, you know, information so that when we do have our Spring Fest in April, we'll have those types of uh, footage out there. We'll have men who are interested in wanting to mentor other men and particularly other young men, because we want we need to get to the young people first because a lot of our old guards like myself, we've, we're all kind of set in our way, you know. But the young folks are the ones that you want to try to impress and share that knowledge. And then, Mayor, fantastic job, because it shouldn't be an hour to get to an ER, you know, to have someone who's sick and uh, going through the throes and so forth. But I just want to say thank you again, and thank you guys for allowing me to be here for Men in the Kingdom. Thank you for being here. Any other questions? 
Not on YouTube? Wow. TJ, you did it again. Like, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn the mic over to Commissioner Bradshaw. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here. You know, this is an ongoing process. This is an ending. We'll just keep the dialogue going. Uh, I will just pick, piggyback on what Alicia said about our Rise Up program and plug the mentors that we have for these young men, these boys, middle school up to high school. So uh, I said this the other day in a speech I was given. When, when I show up to plug the program, right, these little boys look at me and they see an old geezer, <laughs> right? That's what I am to them, a geezer. But the mentors in the Rise Up program are students at Morehouse. They're a lot closer in age to these boys and have a lot more in common with their life experience. So I'm very proud of those young men for stepping up to the plate. Now, initial orientation is on the campus at Morehouse, so they get to walk around the college campus as middle school boys and, and put that in their heads that that's a path. And what you said is so so critical, I've said it for years, is we got to get them while they're young. That's, a, that's our best shot to put them on the right path. When I look back on my own life, had, had it not been for certain interventions in my life, who knows where I'd have ended up. So uh, so anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, an ongoing process, the lines of communication between all of us are wide open, and I'm just grateful for everybody's presence. And I'll yield back to my boss, our chief of staff. <laughs> all right. All, all hearts and minds are settled. We got our questions out. If not, you leave here tonight, something comes up, you've got a question, a comment, what our business card should be out front. I've got mine. We'll make sure that you have our contact information. We are very responsive district. If you call us, email us, we will respond. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.